7. Environment Minister meets with the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy on Climate, John Kerry, on the margins of a high-level meeting in the U.K. Winner of government's Land for Jobs incentive speaks with ABS News. Quest for compensation. Bico policyholders across the region assemble high-powered legal team for class action lawsuit. And never before seen footage of new scanners aimed at improving border security at the new port warehouse. The details right now. The local evening news is brought to you by Nagico, local agents, Bryson's Insurance. Good evening, you're in tune with the ABS Evening News. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Garfield Burford. And I'm Sequoia Servia. Thank you for joining us. Environment Minister Sir Malwin Joseph is calling for urgent global action on reducing carbon emissions. That's right, Sequoia. Sir Malwin is representing Chairman of the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, Prime Minister Arnold Gaston Brown, of the United Kingdom's July Ministerial. Minister Joseph met with United States Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, on the margins of the meeting on Sunday. Sal Malwin says major emitters, especially those within the Group of 20, or G20, need to step up their ambition to reduce their emissions by 2030. He says this message from small island developing states seems to be well received. Well, Sir Malwin also says there seems to be a greater appreciation by the conference for SIDS bearing the brunt of the negative effects of climate change, Sir Malwin says major emitters must accept responsibility to support small island developing states. He's representing, as I said, Prime Minister Brown at the meeting which began last Thursday and which ends this Wednesday. Of course, this meeting is a key uh, decision forum ahead of the COP26, the conference of the parties taking place in Glasgow, Scotland later this year. Crucial discussions taking place at this meeting. A major developing story indeed. Let's move on to another one that we're following closely because the winner of the government's Land for Jobs incentive is beaming with delight this evening, a little over a week since her name was chosen in the raffle. We met up today with 20-year-old Kiwana Edwards of McKinnon's as she saw her parcel of land in Judges Hill for the very first time. It is valued at some $68,000. Terry Andrews spoke with the winner and her family. Flanked by her family, 20-year-old Kiwana Edwards right. visited her 8,000 square feet of land at Judges Hill. Viewing officer at Central Housing and Planning Authority, Winston Phoenix, showed Kiwana her parcel as her face beamed with excitement. This is the perfect land for my dream home. I was shocked, but I'm still blessed and grateful. She says this is a gift she was not expecting, but her family plans on fencing the plot of land for now. Kiwana is fully vaccinated. She received both the jabs at the Villa Plotty Clinic, the first on May 15 and her second on June 15. She says it was the best decision she's ever made. Her mother, Zoe Williams, broke the news to the family. I had goosebumps. My whole body was trembling, shivering. I was screaming. I ran from upstairs to downstairs to break the news to the family. Everybody was in disbelief, but yeah. Up to this day, I still can't believe it. It is the government's initiative geared towards encouraging people to get vaccinated and move the country closer towards achieving herd immunity. Terry Andrew, ABS News. In this ABS News update, turnout for the Sinopharm vaccine has been low so far after about a week since its public rollout. Chair of the Vaccine Education Committee, Dr. Janelle Charles-Williams, says only 36 doses of the China-developed vaccine have been administered. Monday and Friday of last week, an average of seven doses were administered daily. Friday saw the highest uptick in numbers with nine people getting the jab. Health officials are hopeful there will be a turnaround in, a couple, in the coming days. Antigua and Barbuda received 20,000 doses of the Sinopharm vaccine from the People Republic, People's Republic of China back in June. Well, while the coronavirus has arrested the world's focus over the last year and a half, the global battle also continues against Another virus, this time HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. There are new figures this evening from senior counselor and educator at the AIDS Secretariat, Oswald Hennes. 314 persons have since died, um, and we have over 235 persons in care. So, again, I just want to encourage persons that things are happening, treatments is available, and so feel free to come in, test, know your status, and if you are positive, 
you can access the services readily. Hanez says the figures for 2020, though, have been somewhat encouraging. At the end of December, the current stats stands at 1,015 persons, 692 males, 598 females, and the total count for last year stands at 29, 20 males, 9 females, and I'm happy to say that that has been the lowest numbers since 2014. Well, as part of its mandate, the Secretariat has embarked upon several HIV education programs, particularly within schools. Meanwhile, an HIV testing drive is being planned for this weekend. We're going to look at testing on Friday and Saturday of this week, the 30th and the 31st. So for Friday, we'll be offering testing from 8.30 in the morning to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And on Saturday morning, we're going from 8.30 to 3 o'clock. And in other news, local BICO policyholders could recover substantial funds by joining a class action lawsuit at the Caribbean Court of Justice, or CCJ. That's according to British American Insurance Company Limited and Colonial Life Insurance Company Limited Policyholders Group, or BACOL. The group has assembled a legal team to secure compensation for policyholders affected by BICO's 2009 collapse. Jamie Jeroche reports on the class action's media launch today. BACO says more than 7,500 BICO policyholders from the Eastern Caribbean have lost money following the insurance company's 2009 collapse. People like farmer Edmund Lewis invested their life savings in the company. Hit me hard because I'm going to tell you what. Three of my four boys was in college. They had to pull out. I had to dig real deep to save these lands. I used to sit in the bush and cry. He says his wife also wanted to further her studies but couldn't because of the failed investment. My wife me, watched me in my face and tell me, I told you that insurance are thieves. Lewis says the company funded him around $30,000 from his investment that was worth over $170,000. Buckle says over $800 million EC dollars is owed to policyholders. It's seeking full compensation for its members plus 10 years interest. Group President Dr. Patrick Antoine says most policyholders in Antigua and Barbuda and Grenada have registered to the class action suit. More than 70% for Antigua of policyholders registered and we're looking to get the other 30% on board. And in the case of Grenada, it's about 65 to 70% uh, to as well. He says registration is starting in the other countries, Dominica, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Policyholders in Antigua and Barbuda can join through local case manager Stacy Roach Richards of Richards and Company. Dr. Antoine says because Anguilla is not a CARICOM member, its policyholders can't join the suit since the group is seeking remedy under the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. UK based attorney Simon Davenport QC heads the legal team. He says the Trinidad and Tobago government only rescued its citizens when it bailed out the company's local arm. The case now issued freshly by the customers of British American alleges that Trinidad acted in breach, squarely in breach, of its treaty obligations and discriminated against them on the grounds of nationality. The lawyer says they'll begin the class action suit by applying to the Caribbean Court of Justice for special leave to start substantial legal proceedings. The court has not yet set a date for the hearing. Jamie J. Roche, ABS News. In the meantime, the group is inviting policyholders to Zoom town hall meetings this week to learn more about the legal action. The meeting for Antiguan and Barbudan policyholders will be on Thursday. This ABS News update now. And the woman who was saved from a burning wooden structure in Sutherlands has died. On July 10, a 73-year-old Arminta Williams was rescued from a burning 10 by 10 home by passers-by traveling in a vehicle. She was then rushed to hospital in an ambulance with burns about her body. Williams passed away at the Sir Lester Bird Mount St. John's Medical Center last Monday. Her family confirms her death was as a result of pneumonia. Last weekend proved busy for the nation's law enforcement, who conducted several operations resulting in a string of arrests. On Friday, Manlight Blazai Simmons of Bolens was found with two and a half pounds of cured cannabis in his possession. He was arrested and charged with possession of cannabis and possession with intent to transfer. Dextine Carlene and Sharissa Glasgow were jointly charged with possession of firearm and possession of ammunition on Saturday. 
Following a search warrant at their Otis residence, law enforcement discovered 1.38 millimeter pistol and 1.38 round of ammunition. Also on Saturday, Sadiq Joseph of Union Road Hatton was arrested and charged with larceny of building materials. Two men are now in police custody after separate searches of their prime homes revealed an imitation firearm, cannabis, and camouflage clothing. Meanwhile, police investigations continue after officers found Cedar Grove residents, Kareem Charles and Jamal Nelson, in possession of a number of household items on Sunday. Well, this developing story now, Port Manager Darwin Telemac expects the project to redevelop the facility at Deepwater Harbor will be completed by no later than April next year. He provided that timeline as he outlined changes to vehicular and pedestrian access, which took effect this morning. Severe in my timing, but uh, I'm hoping that by April of next 2022, we should be done. April we should 2022. Be, yes, we should be handed the keys. All of the aspects of this project will be over and we can probably say, yes, let's get it done. That's the timeline from the port manager as he provides an update on the transformative project, which is being bankrolled. We are hoping that by, uh, I'm being a little uh, aggressive here in my timing, but uh, I'm hoping that by April of next 2022, we should be done. April should 2022. Be, yes, we should be handed the keys. All of the aspects of this project will be over and we can probably say, yes, let's get it done. That's the timeline from the port manager as he provides an update on the transformative project, which is being bankrolled by a loan from the People's Republic of China. He went on to tell me it could even be completed earlier than this timeline. The port continues to operate at full capacity even as that work is continuing. Now, changes have taken effect as of Monday to improve access and efficiency. Those adjustments in access to the facility greeted consumers on Monday. So the separation between the warehouse cargo and the containerized cargo happens right here. Left, if you're going to the warehouse, right, if you're going down with the rigs. Okay, now, if you're not a rig, it's not too confusing. Yes. You're a car, you're a truck, you're a bus. You just go van, to the red gate there. to the red gate, yes. wide open gate, go in, you will see the signs. The signs will be up in a little bit. It will say parking lot, go to the parking lot. From here, those accessing the port are directed to the parking lot from where there is a seamless arrangement for collecting goods from the ultra-modern warehouse. If you are receiving cargo, you first have to clear it with customs and the port, and then you will be told to go get your truck or hire your truck to come pick up your cargo. When that's done, you exit west. Okay? So that's the, the, the flow. And for those who walked to the facility, an arrangement has been made for them as well. The idea now is that customers will come east from east, heading west, and turn in here, walk up that street, up that little pathway there, and access the warehouse, heading west, into the gate. So this is what this is really this set up only for those folks who may have gotten dropped off at the roundabout. And we see that happening. They're walking into the port. They would turn in here, go into the warehouse to be processed, and they do that right here. Employees of China's Civil Engineering Construction Corporation were busy on Sunday ensuring all was ready for Monday morning. And these never-before-seen images inside the new warehouse show how the new operations improve efficiency and the flow of logistics. We have, uh, that would be the Ministry of the Solid Waste Authority. Here you would have the plant health uh, area. This is customs operations. This is where you do your warrants. And you go through all the stuff that you need to process your goods. On the other side here, we have uh, the area that the Treasury is most uh, excited about. This is where all the taxes are collected. You know, the new warehouse also features equipment which improves border security. We were there as he showed new scanners which have been installed. What you see in here are some significant technological enhancements. Uh, these are manned by uh, Antigua Customs. This is do and his guys. And um, we are looking at a uh, pallet scanner, uh, one that can scan very large boxes as well as pallets. And on the other side, we have one that does smaller boxes. And um, uh, we have barrels, uh, barrel scanner, and boxes on the other side. Well, manager there, Darwin Telemac, he says the enhancement with the technology makes the new warehouse one of the best equipped in the region. In other news, if this country's future is to be secured, youth entrepreneurship must be a major focus. Those are the sentiments of Social Transformation Minister, the Honorable Dean Jonas. 
During his appearance on Antigua Barbuda today, Jonas, Jonas says this is a fundamental tenet of the national youth policy approved by cabinet last Wednesday. More young people owning their own businesses is a major thrust outlined in the national youth policy approved by cabinet last Wednesday. Social Transformation Minister, the Honorable Dean Jonas, whose portfolio includes youth affairs, says youth entrepreneurship is paramount. Some of the key things that we're going to be touch on is youth entrepreneurship. That, that for me is very dear. In consulting with young people, what we discovered is that a lot of our young people have some basic skills and talents that could help them to earn an income without having to go seek a job from anyone. Essential to the policy, he says, will be assessing the deficits and assisting youth to make the transition. What they lack is guidance, direction, and how. What do I need to do to get this business started, to get things going? One of the things that we're going to be doing in the Department of Youth Affairs is to provide them with this guidance and direction. Jonas adds the appointment of a new Director of Youth Affairs in the person of Dr. Drusilla Samuel is paramount in the process. We've had directors before that we've changed out, but I don't think we've had anyone with her skill sets heading the Department of Youth Affairs over the last 20 years. That brings what she brings to the table. The National Youth Policy 2021 saw collaboration among local and regional stakeholders to include the OECS Secretariat. For ABS News, I'm Ursil Charles Jr. Stay with us more of the national developments we've been closely following for you this evening on the ABS Evening News, including this one. Prime Minister and CARICOM Chairman discusses the situation in strife torn Haiti during recent visit of high-level official. And later, the HALO Foundation provides crucial assistance to the Girl Guides Association, which is marking a major milestone. We'll tell you what that milestone is, upcoming on the ABS Evening News, on air and online. Please stay with us, please. At Nagico, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like your boat when you're at sea and you get away from everything. Your home and the security of your daughter's things. And the car that you've had for too long. But after all these years, you just can't let go. At Magico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. Janserve is committed to keeping Antigua and Barbuda safe with our mass sanitization program. Our methods are safe, effective, and efficient, and eliminate pathogens, mold, bacteria, and viruses, especially COVID-19. We are introducing the EPA-approved Victory Innovations Electrostatic Sprayer and Vital Oxide Disinfecting Sanitizer. Our solution is even safe to use around children. It's odorless, easy to use, and will disinfect areas and surfaces for up to five to seven days, depending on application. The electrostatic sprayer atomizes the molecules of the Vital Oxide to adhere itself to all surfaces. It's much more effective than wiping. We are committed to using the most advanced sanitization methods for the safety and health of everyone. For the cleanest clean, contact JanServe today. JanServe is a service mark of the Akima Group Incorporated. with Automotive Art. Automotive Art is giving you the chance to stay at Buccaneer Beach Club or win a car spa package from Island View Car Wash with exclusive discounts from 15 to 50% off to special service packages including your tires, batteries, oils, and tools. It's so easy to enter our raffle when you spend $250 or more. Visit Automotive Art on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube and win big this summer with Automotive Art. This promotion ends September 4th. 
Bed, Bath, and Beyond Sale, July 26 to July 31, at the Antigua Home and Garden Center. That's right, savings up to 45% off select sheets, bedding, and pillows, up to 30% off select towels and bath decor, and 30% off decorative cushions, 20% off all other home goods. Don't delay. Buy now when prices are at their lowest. July 26 to July 31. Bed, bath, and beyond a sale. A warm welcome back. The Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party is to carry up polling in two constituencies to determine which candidates will be most viable for the next general elections. Party leader Prime Minister Gaston Brown provides this update. We have commenced our pollings. Um, we should complete our pollings in two constituencies within the next two to three weeks. The first two constituencies that will be polled will be St. John's Rural West and St. Peter. The ABLP's Landel Benjamin, who the Prime Minister says is advancing, advancing in age, is currently the Member of Parliament for St. John's Rural West. We have discussed this matter with him, and I believe I'm at liberty to say that we indicated to him that, look, if he's still the best option, we have no choice but to move forward um, with him. But if um, after we poll and he's struggling to win the seat or he can't win the seat, then we'll have to have a discussion with him. He also provides an update on the prospective candidates to represent the party in St. Peter. The contenders in that um, area, uh, as well as Michael Joseph, those are the four individuals who will be polling. We will be polling um, Mr. Regis Burton, uh, we're polling Shemaine Jeremy and Rodden Turner. Asset Michael won the St. Peter seat on the ABLP ticket in 2018. The Prime Minister says he has more faith in the credibility of polls as opposed to primaries, which he say can be easily manipulated. Well, developing story now, and CARICOM Chairman and Prime Minister Honorable Gaston Brown warns the UN, the United Nations, to work with the regional group in CARICOM to achieve stability in Haiti. Haiti's long standing issues peaked with President Jovenel Moise's assassination this month. Prime Minister Brown discussed the issue with the United Nations General Assembly President Walkan Bozkir last week. The Peace Commission that you have could be one of the institutions within the UN that could be utilized to provide some level of um, stability um, um, in Haiti. Well, Chairman Brown says he's had discussions with former interim Prime Minister Claude Joseph and will seek dialogue with current Prime Minister Ariel Henry this week. To see how we can collaborate and to, to assist Haiti in coming up with its own um, homegrown solution. This developing story at this hour. A group of individuals staged a protest today over the government's policy to require its unvaccinated frontline employees to test for COVID-19 every two weeks. Some of those gathered across, the across from the Prime Minister's office made claims about COVID-19 vaccines without scientific evidence. We have more from Jessica Russell. Just across from the Prime Minister's office, a group of protesters came to speak out against a recently announced vaccination policy. About 70 people picketed against the government's plans to have unvaccinated public sector and tourism frontline workers tested for COVID-19 every two weeks at their own expense. The regulation is expected to take effect August 1st. The signs clearly show the protesters' concerns about vaccines. Another sign shows resistance to well-established safety protocols in response to the pandemic. This man makes unfounded claims about vaccines. I heard rumors that this vaccine, those who take it in two years will die. And we have to make up our mind to criminate these people because there's so much people dying, we don't have enough hole to bury them. And some of them will become a zombie. He says this is his source of information. It's all on my phone. There's so much. However, science has not provided evidence to back its claims. Meanwhile, this vendor says why she's not taking currently available vaccines. I'm positively think that the, the vaccine is not safe. I'm not against anyone who wants to take the vaccine, but for me personally, I, I am definitely do not want to take that vaccine. Here's her reason on why she thinks they're unsafe. It's too quick. Um... I'm, I'm just not feeling the right, you know, I think this is something that's totally out of our control. A government worker says he believes there are sinister motives behind the vaccines. Well, the population is at hand and the evil nations and them are trying 
for the public. Uh. It's a difficult position for him to be in because he does not want to be tested bi-weekly for the virus either. I'm not doing no test. We're not doing no test because we don't trust the test even. Unvaccinated public sector workers who choose not to be tested will be asked to stay home without pay. Meanwhile, the health ministry says over 27,000 people have been tested using PCR technology. Others have also been tested using antigen tests. Meanwhile, this man who says he's not an anti-vaxxer says a different approach to encouraging people to get the jab should have been taken. Instead of going on a public campaigning about the vaccine and educate people properly, he's forcing it down your throat. Jessica Russell, ABS News. The World Health Organization and other reputable health agencies have made it clear that vaccination is the most effective route out of the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Health Organization is calling for 70% of the population of all countries to be vaccinated by the middle of next year. The Girl Guides Association of Antigua and Barbuda is celebrating 90 years of service in the Twin Island State. Shana Keisha Francis reports on an anniversary service to mark the occasion on Sunday and how the Halo Foundation is helping the guides to help others. In 1931, the first batch of young girls and women began the journey of what would later become one of the oldest serving organizations in Antigua and Barbuda. In celebrating their 90th year of service, the Girl Guides Association held an anniversary service which was attended by their excellencies, Governor General Sir Rodney Williams and Lady Williams. While addressing the congregation, Lady Williams announced some welcomed news. In recognition of your 90th anniversary, and in keeping with the spirit of giving, the HALO Foundation will be donating, I know it's a much needed, <laughs> much needed new double door, uh, front door next week for installation <laughs> at the Girl Guides headquarters, at the Girl Guides headquarters in Deanery Lane. She shares her hopes that the donation will be beneficial to the association. We are honored to be associated with the Girl Guides Association and hope that with this gift, your financial burden will be reduced and the headquarters will not only be more aesthetically pleasing, but also a safer and a sturdier edifice. The service continued with presentations from members of the Girl Guides, both young and old. The current president of the association, Okira Lee, outlined the sterling service provided by the guides. 90 years of celebrating, 90 years of memories, of preparing our young girl and women to make their mark through service. If you are one who was fortunate to serve in any period of these 90 years, you would know the smile. You would feel the pride you could understand with certainty the significance of our 90 years. The Girl Guides Association aims to continue successfully providing service in Antigua and Barbuda for years to come. For ABS News, I am Shana Keisha Francis. Thanks so much, Shana Keisha. Congratulations indeed to the Girl Guides. Yes. You were one? No, unfortunately. Right. Not right. a part of that right. group. All right, stay with us for more of the stories that we're tracking for you this time in news overseas. Packed segment ahead coming up. We'll be crossing live to St. Lucia. After electors there went to the polls today in general elections, we'll get an update on how things have been going. And internationally, get vaccinated by mid-September or submit to weekly COVID-19 tests. The very clear message to New York City municipal workers. Those stories all ahead on the ABS Evening News, on air and online. Do stay with us, please.